people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. Correspondence between podcaster Karee Bradshaw and undisputed middleweight champion Clarissa Shields. Karee Query, any info on the rematch clause? The clause Savannah Marshall is said to have one, and she is said to have activated it. Clarissa responded by saying, who cares honestly? She lost. And I'm only having one boxing match in 2023. The rest is MMA. I can care less about what she's saying and what loser thinks they call shots. We're not fighting in the UK. She don't come to America. She'll have to move to a different weight class. She's not getting another shot at my belts in the United Kingdom. Fight in the USA. Sky Sports and Boxer paid for that first fight to happen. They paid for that show. And they're a UK-based network. They cater to a UK audience. They're not going to bankroll a fight that takes place in America. It's as simple as that. It's really not a question of Savannah Marshall trying to dictate terms to Clarissa Shields or Savannah Marshall trying to call the shots. Put simply, if you want the fight to be in America, you have to find somebody to pay for it. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. And maybe Clarissa doesn't want it to happen because she has other things to do, other things she plans on doing next year. What's most intriguing about this exchange is that Clarissa stated she She's only going to have one boxing match next year. If she only has one boxing match, you do have to question who's left out there for her to fight. And if she keeps insisting she doesn't want to go back to the UK, who's going to pay for it? Who's going to bankroll her next fight? And on what platform will it take place? Dimitri Salida, her longtime promoter, he doesn't have a broadcast partner. There's been a lot of talk about a Shields versus Jonas fight, but that fight would presumably take place in the UK. I mean, it would have to if you want Sky Sports and Boxer to foot the bill. And given that Natasha Jonas, she doesn't fight on the cheap. She makes very good money. I hardly think she'd fly over to America. To fight Clarissa Shields for peanuts on a dollar? It's a logistics issue if it's anything. It's not an outlandish request. It's not an outlandish demand that Clarissa want to fight out of America moving forward. But at its base, it is a logistics issue. If that's what you want, where's the money for your fights? Where? Where's it supposed to come from? You don't have a broadcast partner. It sounds like Clarissa Shields is going to be resuming her endeavor into the world of mixed martial arts. And it sounds like she's going to spend most of next year doing that. It's conceivable that if she spends most of her time in the world of mixed martial arts, the belts she currently holds at 160 pounds, they may go vacant. After a while. You know, this rematch might not happen next year. It's entirely possible that if they don't go straight into a rematch, Clarissa Shields and Savannah Marshall. And Clarissa Shields spends most of her year in the world of mixed martial arts. It's, it's conceivable that maybe the second fight don't happen next year. Between Clarissa Shields' demand that the fight happen in America, not having a U.S. broadcast partner, and Ben Shalom's recent statements that they're not going straight into a Clarissa Shields fight, that what he would like is for Savannah to fight one or two more times before going into that rematch. The situation as it is looks a lot like we're not going to get that second fight next year. We might not. The saving grace is that there are a lot of other girls left out there for Savannah Marshall to fight. Girls like Christina Hammer, former unified middleweight champion Christina Hammer, former champion Aline Cedar Ruse, unbeaten up and comer Raquel Miller, unbeaten Jacques Deja Green, the winner of Franchon Cruz versus Hannah Gabriels, set to go down next year. The saving grace and the silver lining, at least for Savannah, is that there are other girls at or around these weights that she can fight. Most of which don't come with the hefty price tag and all the demands of a Clarissa Shields. These are all doable fights. It won't be that expensive. Not as expensive. Fights with some of these other fighters at or around these weights. And Savannah Marshall, despite of suffering her first professional loss, the fight with Clarissa was an exhilarating fight, an entertaining fight. And Savannah Marshall herself, with or without Clarissa, is an entertaining fighter. She is a knockout artist. Not everybody's going to be able to stand up to her power the same way that Clarissa did. So there are still many interesting fights to make for Savannah at or 
around these weights, whether a Shields rematch happens or it doesn't happen. An outside looking in, based on what's going on and what's being said, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. In men's lightweight news, Gervonta Davis, on the heels of his recent arrest and making bond, he posted this to his social media, a lengthy caption that reads, Do not let these people misguide you all on this bullshit. This was just yesterday, moments before me and my child, mother, had an argument, watching Frozen with my oldest daughter. I never put my hands on my child's mother, nor my fucking daughter. Are you fucking crazy? I'm not a monster. I've been quiet for too long. I don't have a media team, public relations, a good lawyer, spokesman, nothing of that. That's the only reason I'm doing this now, just to clear my name. I've been doing this shit on my own since I started this shit. These people didn't put out so much stuff, aired this everywhere, and have a fucking helicopter flying over my house now as I write this, because they look at this shit as money to them, and trying to get as much money as possible. They rushed to my child's mother, offering her 50000 just to press charges, like they did with my first child's mother. So bad, they couldn't get her, so they got a lady they claimed she was into the mess also a lady that's known for suing people for money reasons they got her which i have to pay three hundred thousand dollars to and i didn't lay a finger on her or even know what this lady looks like they're doing this for money too and also to destroy me i am not a monster i have two beautiful daughters that have to grow up someday and see this bullshit they post this bullshit worldwide before anything they even post a snippet of the police call which my child's mother was crying on the phone because i wouldn't give her my truck Shade Room. Gossip in the city. It's on site. And the rest of the internet blogs. Y'all are bad for the culture. Y'all don't care if it's true or false. He did it or didn't. Y'all just want to put it out there because it's beneficial to your businesses. I don't think he's wrong there. There's less of an emphasis these days on whether or not a story is true or false as opposed to how fast you can get it out there and how many clicks does it bring you. These days, people don't really care if a story is true or not. They only care about what kind of reactions it might garner, though given Gervonta Davis's history. In a court of law, Gervonta hasn't been convicted yet, but in the court of public opinion, it does look a certain way. In the court of public opinion to a lot of people, he's as good as guilty because this much stuff doesn't happen by accident. Because this isn't Gervonta Davis's first run-in with the law. This isn't his first domestic violence dispute. There's literally a video of him shaking his lady friend in a public place and if you're willing to do that in a public place you can't compose yourself you can't contain your anger in a public place what are you like behind closed doors it doesn't help Gervonta Davis's image it doesn't help public perception of this latest situation none of it helps Gervonta Davis posted this video to his social media and in the video we see the mother of Gervonta Davis's child walking away in a house that is in some disarray. Javante Davis himself, his shirt is ripped open, noticeable spit on his forehead and nose, presumably from his... It looks like there was an argument, looks like there was a domestic dispute, but does any of this absolve him of culpability? Does this video prove his innocence? Does this video prove that he didn't strike her with a closed fist? He claims that all of this is tantamount to extortion. They're just trying to get money out of him. And what started the whole thing was that Javante Davis wouldn't let the mother of his child use his truck. He says that he didn't strike her or his child. It's all open to interpretation. It's a bona fide case, a classic case of he said, she said, because where this is what he is saying. The mother of his child's friend took 911 call paints a very different picture. I don't care. Ma'am, can you hear me? Hello? The emergency. Ma'am, who are you having an argument with? 
Please, please, I need ma'am, to go home. Ma'am, who are you having an argument I need with? To go home, please. <laughs> ma'am, what's going on? Somebody, let me see if there's somebody on the way. Did she mention any weapons? Uh, not weapons. The last oh, okay. thing she mentioned is the guy spitting at her. Oh, okay. All right, well, uh, we have three officers on the way. Only the people that were there, the affected parties, the aforementioned ones, only they know the truth, the whole truth of what happened, though outside looking in Gervonta Davis's previous history, yeah. run-ins with the law, domestic violence disputes, the fact that there's literally a video of him shaking a woman in a public place. It's very bad optics for him because this ain't his first rodeo. Are we to believe that you keep ending up in situations like this one, just like this one, due to sheer circumstance? Just to run a bad luck. If you want to play devil's advocate and give Javante Davis the benefit of the doubt, it still doesn't look good for him. I mean, what if this is an instance of a toxic relationship, two people that probably shouldn't be together making babies. What if it's exactly the way Javante Davis says it is? Well, even if it were, his previous track record, his previous run-ins with the law, the video of him shaking that woman, it doesn't help his situation. It'll be his word against hers, but he's the one with the track record. And it just is what it is. Javante Davis himself stated, I low-key don't even want to fight anymore. They can have this shit. Ideal conditions for Hector Garcia to perhaps shock the world while Javante Davis is distracted, assuming this fight even goes through. I still think it might not. Between an arrest actually being made, Javante Davis having to make bond, and the recent audio that has been released of the 911 call, well, it's a bit hard to sell a fight under those circumstances. It's a mess. Some recent comments from Javante Davis's longtime trainer, Calvin Ford, seem to indicate, confirm, really, what we already knew, that Calvin Ford doesn't believe world titles are important. That must be why your fight is happy fighting for secondary titles instead of full titles. And he can do that. He can navigate his career however he sees fit. Javante Davis, Calvin Ford, the members of his team, the guys that make the decisions. If fighting for full-fledged alphabet titles in order to become a full-fledged champion or a unified, maybe an undisputed champion, if that doesn't matter to them, it's their prerogative, but they won't be thought of. You're not, you're not the best, the best in show, show, and you're not you're the not best the lightweight, lightweight in the world, in the world based on hypothetical matchups. You have to win actual fights, actual belts from actual champions in order to be thought of in that respect. Joe Blow's fight forecast means fuck all to me in the absence of an actual contest, an actual fight. You might think that Javante Davis is the best thing since sliced bread, but what you think don't mean Bo Diddley if he don't go in there and prove it. They're not important to me, said Ford to the boxing voice when asked how important it is for Davis to win world titles. Certain people were in certain situations to have a better chance to get to them. Davis, though, in the absence of winning more recognized titles, has supplemented his somewhat lack of accomplishments with extraordinarily hefty paychecks. In addition to his fattened bank account, Davis has established himself as one of the biggest and brightest stars in all of boxing. Bigger stars than Gervonta Davis have fought for Alphabet titles, bigger stars than him today still fight for them. Oscar De La Hoya, in his heyday, had a level of celebrity that here today, Gervonta Davis doesn't have. And Oscar De La Hoya, he fought for full-fledged titles, as did Manny Pacquiao, as did Floyd Mayweather, Gervonta Davis's once mentor. You can't make the argument, who needs Alphabet titles because I've got money, when there were fighters that were making more money then in fighting for full-fledged Alphabet titles than you're making now. And even now, the biggest draw in boxing, at least in this part of the world, certainly one of the biggest draws in boxing, Canelo Alvarez, he's an undisputed champion and a four-division champion overall. He fights for full-fledged titles at multiple weights. He's a full-fledged champion an undisputed one, something Gervonta Davis will never be. You can't make the argument. Who needs alphabet titles when I've got money, when that guy's got more money than you do, and more alphabet titles? Put simply, the matchmaking... You're making excuses. You're saying that the only reason some guys are winning those belts is because they're in a position to do so, so why don't you get in position? It's what Devin Haney did, and George Kimbosos before him, and Teofimo Lopez before him, and Vasil Lomachenko before him. What I see is that there's guys out there that are willing to test their metal and mix it up and do their job. Belts are a system. Intended to 
give various fighters a common ground. Give them something to fight for in order to establish a pecking order. The belts are a system intended to bring all these different fighters to the table to establish who's the best one among them in combat. At its base, that's the function of these various alphabet organizations. The Davis people hope to circumvent that arduous process by way of marquee value. They tell themselves we're making decent money as it is without these guys, so we don't need them. I'll tell you that a Davis versus Haney pay-per-view would likely sell a lot better than a Davis versus Hector Garcia pay-per-view. You're not going to make the money with Hector you could be making with a Devin Haney. Rather, the winner of Haney versus Lomachenko, and the same principle rings true of all of Gervonta Davis's box office fights. He and his team are seeking refuge in an anomalous situation with a Ryan Garcia, a fighter who has a very big following in spite of having never been a full-fledged champion. But Ryan, Davis versus Garcia, Ryan Garcia, would sell better than most other fights that are out there. It certainly would sell better than any of Gervonta Davis's previous box office appearances. It would. That fight in and of itself, though, does not represent normalcy. It doesn't speak to the rest of the sport. Beyond that fight, how many more fights like that do you think are out there? If he even makes it to Ryan Garcia, as Javante Davis's career in his home life seems to be imploding. Ryan and Javante are playing the same game. They don't want to have to go through the gears with the best and brightest fighters in the lightweight division. Ryan Garcia was no more interested in taking on Devin Haney than Javante Davis is now. Ryan versus Lomachenko was never even a conversation. Ryan and Javante are playing the same game, and it's all about shortcuts. Shortcuts to the bag. Shortcuts to the money. You two boys can fight, and a winner can emerge. Whoever that winner is... They won't be the best in show at either lightweight or super lightweight. Big fight that that might be. It doesn't crown the best 135 pounder any more than it crowns the best 140 pounder. It's Javante Davis's lightweight resume consist of Gamboa, Cruz, Romero. Beating these guys makes him the best lightweight in the world. Ryan would be a nice scalp for Javante Davis's mantle, but Ryan Garcia never established himself as the best lightweight in the world or even one of the best lightweights in the world. He really didn't. It is a tenuous claim. They'll make your money. If that's what this is all about, just don't complain when people don't think of you the same way they think of some other fighters. And they don't. A few overzealous fanboys aside who think Javante Davis beats everybody based on hypothetical matchups they're having in their head that are not happening in real time, in real life. Delusional. Make your money. But you're never going to be thought of as a, a Duran or a Leonard, a Pacquiao or a Mayweather. You're not going to be thought of as being from the same elk as those fighters by pouncing on guys who, for the most part, everybody expects you to be. It would help if you were winning titles from these guys in unifying divisions, but you're not. You can't have it both ways.